So using art to speak the unspeakable. Every summer, I try to do one sermon that's focused on the fine arts. And I've done things that are musical. I've done um, theater. I've done, some, remember during COVID, I did a whole sermon on uh, Matisse. Um, so this year I decided to do the same, but I went a little different route than usual. It's visual arts, but it's just not a painting or something that you could put on your wall. It's taking the concept of a structure being part of art, which of course it is. So I wanted to lead you into what I mean by that, by giving you some of my background here. This charming little church is Emanuel Lutheran Church in Dixon, Illinois, where I was until I was 11 years old. And this was often a view I saw because I was always in the children's choir up in the balcony looking down. So I just wanted to stop and look. It's a little country church, nothing spectacular from the outside. In fact, this, I think they did something to make it look better than it maybe really is on the inside. But um, what is the structure kind of telling you? As a child, I was always very impressed by this because it's very formal looking. It's very typical Lutheran. Everything focuses up to the front. You probably can't see it, but all these little chandeliers that hang down had um, little pinpoints of a cross on, I think, three or four sides and with a red behind it. So it was very red. So you'd see the strong red crosses and the carpet was this bright red at the time. So to me as a little kid, it was very, very impressive. And of course, they spent a lot of money putting in a real wood ceiling, which was nice. And then the very front, you know, they, they spent it must have been expensive to put a whole stone front on the front of the building and then have that set aside to put in the cross. And so when you're sitting there, it definitely conjured up this image that the light of God was shining in on you. It faced the south. So often during the service, it might even be in your eyes. So as a child, this structure and essentially the art, whoever designed it and the way they laid it out, was very impressive to me. And it just made a lot of sense with the theology that the church had, that everything was ordered and everything was going to be okay if, as long as you went towards that cross, right? Well, then later on, after I'd gone through my phase of rejecting church and coming back, in my, um, I was probably about 22, 23 at this point. This is the first congregational church in Northfield, Minnesota. And um, you can tell that my theology in the church I attended had changed substantially. There's not even a cross up front. Um, this was a congregational church. is very much like a Unitarian Universalist church. In fact, we're cousins theologically. It's all about the congregation. It's all about the community. And you really can't get a sense of it, but this sanctuary curved around so you could kind of see everybody. And what's up front? It's the organ pipes, of course. And then there's a choir loft that you may or not, may not be able to see. And of course, I was in the choir. That's how I always, my entry point to every church. And so it evokes celebration. In fact, I remember one of the first uh, Sundays I was there was Easter Sunday. And, you know, back then, this was the 80s. We had liturgical dancing and, and, and all kinds of things. And I thought, oh, my God, these people are actually happy to be here at church. Whereas I grew up, people were kind of sad and sour all the time. So it's, a, again, an image of um, what the architecture and what the surroundings say about the community and the message that it sends. I should also show you that I gave you the outside of the church, which is a traditional congregational church. But a couple of times while I was in Northfield going to college, I had some tough times. And I remember in the middle of the night, I couldn't sleep and I lived near the church. So I'd walk and across the street was a hill and I'd sit on the hill and just stare at this church and think of the community that was in that building and how supported I felt even in the middle of the night. And then um, actually Jeff Reed suggested this one. So those images were of churches and, and more uplifting spiritually. Um, getting more on what I'm going to talk about today, this is the Vietnam Memorial, if you didn't recognize it. And so this, now we're getting into art pieces, structures that are massive in scale. And this one, those of you that have been around for a while know that it was quite controversial because on the Washington Mall, all the other war memorials are celebrating war, celebrating victories. This one was somber because we lost the war and thousands and thousands and thousands of people died fighting it. So they came up with a somber, and it was a controversial choice, somber, um, polished 
granite surface with all the names um, lit, um, inscribed in it and lit up at night here. And so it's, a, and by a woman, yes, which was also controversial. Thank you, Barb. An Asian woman. We, we like to participate in services here. <laughs> Those of you out on Zoom, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> but yes, yes, there was a lot of things that were different with this structure. And, um, but it evoked a lot of different feelings than the other war memorials. And it caused you to reflect and pause on what we were doing as Americans and what this meant. And I know we've seen thousands of pictures of friends and family at the memorial um, touching the, friend, the names of the people that they know. So what I wanted to talk today is about the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Now, um, I'm gonna talk about what it is and then talk about my experience a little bit. So this is from the website and it says, more than 4,400 African-American men, women, and children were hanged, burned alive, shot, drowned, and beaten to death by white mobs between 1877 and 1950. Millions more, millions more fled the South as refugees from racial terrorism profoundly impacting the entire nation, even those of us in the big cities in the North. Until now, there has been no national memorial acknowledging the victims of racial terror lynchings. On a six acre site atop a rise overlooking Montgomery, the National Lynching Memorial is a sacred space for truth telling and reflection about racial terror in America and its legacy. And I chose this for a number of reasons. First of all, um, just coincidentally, weeks before COVID pandemic, pandemic lockdown, I was there touring it. And um, I had heard a lot about it, but I wasn't ready for how massive this place was and how much, how moved I was and how sacred the space felt. It was absolutely amazing and astounding. And I hope, I know these pictures and videos are not gonna do it justice, but if you ever get a chance, you're down in the South in Alabama, please try to go there. But the way it works, um, so Brian Stevenson, so the head of the Equal Justice Initiative and whose quotes I read earlier and wrote Just Mercy, he must have raised a massive amount of money and I didn't look it up, but this is immense and very, very costly. So what you are gonna see in a minute, there are um, iron pillars, they're solid iron and they're kind of rusting for the 800 counties where lynchings existed in the United States during that time period after the Civil War. And they're suspended from the ceiling. Um, and on each pillar is the name of the county and the names of the people who were lynched and the dates that they died. Now, when you walk, and it's on a big, huge lawn, uh, park kind of structure. And as you walk up to it, there's some sculptures that I'll talk about at the very end. But you descend down, almost like you're going into a, a, a grave or something like that. And you're walking along and it's just cement on both sides and you've gone down a whole story and you turn the corner and there it is. And you've got all these pillars. They're about, I can't touch them. So probably four or five feet above you suspended. And it dawned on me at that moment that if I were at a lynching, that's probably the height that the person who had been lynched would be, maybe a little higher up, but that was the image. And so then you walk along this corridor, just taking this all in. And then it, and in the whole memorial is in a big rectangle. And as, so the first side of the rectangle, you're just going down. Then you turn and you see all of this, and then you begin to ascend. So by the time you get to the final leg of the rectangle, you're actually equal at height with the pillars and you're kind of interacting with them. So I wanted to give you a sense of that before I um, show you what you're gonna see. It was, um, it had just rained. So it was kind of this mystical kind of environment in the first place and it was a weekday. So it wasn't very crowded and it just, I couldn't say anything. I mean, there, there wasn't anybody to say anything to but you were just kind of stunned and taking this all in and reading all of these names and all of these counties and 800 of these iron pillars. It's just mind boggling to me. So let me show you what this looks like. So this 
On your left is a close-up example of one of the pillars. So this is for Winston County, Mississippi, and you can see the dates, and they start um, from the oldest and to the most recent of everyone of, that was lynched. And then you can get a sense on the right-hand side of how this worked. Now, they're suspended from this roof, and the, as I said, the roof stays level the whole time. The floor changes below it. So this is near the end of it where you can see they're only about three, four feet off the ground, off the floor, and they put a little um, place as if they were going to someday lower so that they're, um, it, it, you know, you can see where they would lower into. I mean, unless they're lowering them for some maintenance, I think it's more that you don't walk under it or walk into it or something like that because it would be easy to do, but gives you a sense of what this looks like. So I'm going to, the next one, when I got near the end of it, I took my camera and I just did a 360, turned around the whole thing. So I'm going to give you that video so you can see what that looks like. Apologize for the choppiness of the zoom signal. And then finally, I want to give you a sense of this place. There. So it's this huge lawn, and that's how big and massive the structure is. So like I said, it's, it's art, but it's in a whole different scale of art. So that is what the monument is like the memorials like, but there's another end to this memorial. They didn't just want to build something like in Washington, D.C., where there's all these memorials. Like a lot of the Vietnam Memorial, there's one, I think, between Oshkosh and Fond du Lac out on Highway 41. Other communities did things to honor their local dead. They wanted to do the same thing. So there's, um, they want every county to acknowledge the lynchings in every case. And so, there's one story I wanted to share with you this morning, the story of Elwood Higginbottom. And the source is from the Mississippi Free Press by Grace Marion, and it was published not too long ago, April 26, 2022. And the title of this article is Pastoral Scenes of a Gallant South, Lynching Victims Finally Memorialized in Oxford. Oxford, Mississippi is right up near the top of Mississippi. It's where the University of Minnesota, um, Mississippi is. Um, but it's not too far from Memphis. So news of Elwood Higginbottom's death reached the Lafayette County Courthouse before the jury had finished deliberating his case, cutting the September 17, 1935 trial short. Just a few hours earlier, rumors had circulated that the white jury would find Higginbottom not guilty after Judge Taylor McElroy instructed the jury to consider whether the black man was justified in killing Glenn Roberts, a white man. Higginbottom had pleaded self-defense. So here's the story of what happened. After getting into a disagreement over land with Higginbottom, news reports said Roberts came to the sharecropper's home armed with a pistol and with 25 other men in tow. So obviously it was self-defense. When it was reported that Higginbottom would likely be found not guilty, a mob of 50 white men gathered outside the jail at an address that now would, be, would now be inside the Lafayette County Chancery Courthouse. The mob made their way into the jail, reportedly overpowering the sheriff and then abducting Higginbottom. They hanged shot and left Higginbottom to die dangling from a tree of the corner of what is today Molly Bar Road and North Lamar Boulevard, castrating him before leaving. Elwood, also a labor organizer, was not yet 29 years old when he died. After Higginbottom's murder, his wife and children fled Lafayette County. Locals beat and threatened his siblings with lynching, forcing them to flee as well. Prioritizing safety, branches of the Higginbottom family lost touch with each other as they escaped. 
As time went on, the Higginbottoms didn't talk about their patriarch's lynching, leaving much of the family in dark for decades. And despite the fact that more than 150 men, women, and children watched the mob lynch Higginbottom, no one was ever arrested for the murder in Lafayette County, continuing the fearful effects of white terror on the county's 8,236 black residents, then 41% and today 23% of the county's population. So I wanna go on a little bit further with Elwood Higginbottom's memorial. And so in 2018, they actually held a memorial service for him. Um, oh, there's, yeah, okay, I'll go here. Sorry, change my slides around a little bit. Um, so they were able to um, work on a service and a colleague of mine, um, uh, Gail Stratton, who went to um, seminary with me, was one of the leaders of this. And in the county, it took five years, and COVID was part of this, to get a lot of things finally in place. Now, the ceremony took place in 2018, but they, they had things together for the ceremony, but didn't quite have it able to put in. So it's a little mishmash from the timeline perspective. But nonetheless, um, they had the family come together and were able to do a ceremony. And then you can see on the right, there's two plaques. One of them is about lynching in America, and the other one is the specifics about this lynching and how it happened to be. E.W., which is Elwood's son, was still alive in 2018. He had been four years old when his father was killed. And unfortunately, he died of COVID in 2020. Um, and then you'll see, I'm gonna show you a video and there's a person with a long gray uh, braid and that's my friend Gail talking to EW in the video. There's also another part to this where they, you'll see them, they're collecting dirt in two jars. And the whole idea is to take the dirt, the ground from the lynching and send one back to the National Memorial in, in uh, Montgomery and keep another in the county so that there's sort of a remembrance for it into the future. One more thing, and I know this uh, video is a little blurry, that was on purpose because I wanted to blow it up so you could see it on the screen, that's okay. Um, the images in front is what's important here. So I told you there was 800 iron pillars in the memorial. Every one of them has a duplicate that's laying in this yard when you get outside of it. And it's part of the garden, it's, it's groomed, it's you know pea gravel. The idea is that someday, not only would you have a plaque for Elwood Hingle, um, Higginbottom, but you would also take the iron pillar that's a duplicate and it would be in that square in Lafayette County so that there's a duplicate um, reach out program from every county back to the National Memorial. So that's what you see here. They haven't figured out exactly how to do that yet, but they're just sitting there waiting to go. So with that, I'm gonna give you um, the video. The reason I'm playing it is so that you get a little bit more about the family of Elwood Higginbottom, but also understand that by having this happen to create this memorial brought a lot of healing to this family, which if you can imagine in 1935, your father being murdered in such a brutal way and you and all of your relatives just to have to scatter to the wind, run to Memphis, and then they ended up out on the East Coast and all over and lost touch with each other. And so the Equal Justice Initiative, when they were researching lynchings, had all this information of where everybody had ended up. And so my friend Gail and their committee reached out to all of them and many of them didn't even know the others existed and didn't even know the story. So it created a, a moment for healing, not just for the family, but also for the community. And you'll hear that in the presentation. I'm in contact with E.W. Higginbottom, who is the last living child of Elwood Higginbottom. When we went to the Montgomery uh, grand opening, we were sitting side by side and he was just crying and he's like, I didn't even know I had all of these you know, family members and oh my goodness. And he was filled at that time with you know, people really wanting to take the time out to not only 
recognize the people that were lynched, but inform him of who his father was, you know, as not just a sharecropper, but he was called the hero of the sharecroppers because he said, this is my land, you will not trespass on it. And uh, I, I get to say what happens to my land. I've been around here for 87 years and I think about with my grandkids, I never had the opportunity to even know my daddy if I was only four years old when he was killed. He was never able to take me to a game or do anything. I can't say I miss my daddy but I never knew him. So that's all I got to say about Well, then when he got to the memorial that was specifically for his father in uh, Oxford, Mississippi, he said that he was just really extremely overwhelmed and he felt like, yes, finally, you know, people are recognizing that this happened to my father. So he was like, yes, this is, this is good, you know, and, and that was like a finale, like, I can rest now. And he's like, thank God that I was able to live long enough to see somewhat of justice come to my father for what uh, happened to him when he was only trying to protect his own. <laughs> I became a family historian when my, my brother Richard Higginbottom passed away and I inherited his project that's called the Higginbottom Family Tree Project. Uh, the research that's been done uh, for the purpose of memorializing those who were lynched has um, really facilitated our family, the Higginbottom family, in uh, re rediscovering each other We've expanded to over a thousand more family members that we were able to connect with and to really understand where we are because we're all over, you know, all, like literally all over the U.S. We're, you know, in Germany and, you know, different places like that. The children that are direct descendants of Elwood Higginbottom didn't even know anything about the hundreds and hundreds. And, and the amazing thing is that some of those relatives were right in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, where the family migrated to once the lynching happened. So you're like right on top of each other uh, and don't even know that you're related to each other. So we were able to uh, really begin the reconnection process through the, uh, the memorialization process. What, what we find is that uh, people either really want to talk about it or they really do not want to talk about it. And we need to recognize that history is history. It's something that happened. We can't change what happened, but we can change what we do going forward. So far as the injustices that are happening today, we need to recognize that they're not so dissimilar from what happened back then. We need to recognize that we're all equal. And so far as what happened in the past, we can't hold the descendants of those ancestors who did that at responsible for their actions. We have to be responsible for our own actions. So I would love to meet the people who family members were involved in what happened to my cousin and to say if you are not of the mindset as your ancestors were then you do not have to be accountable right you have to be accountable for your actions if you are in the same mindset then you have to still be accountable for your actions but for those who are 
not like their ancestors, but whole guilt in regards to what happened, you just need to let it go, you know, because you didn't have any control of that. You have control of today and how you act today. That's it. Isn't it amazing that after all of that and knowing all of that history, that she could still, still show so much grace and mercy and moving on? I should also let you know that we reached out to the family to make sure that it was okay to show you this video and that it's recorded. So for those of you that are watching this recording later, we have permission um, because they want this story to be told. So I'm gonna close with another part of the sculpture um, of this massive art piece. And it's on the walkway coming in and leaving, they had some very dramatic sculptures, which I could probably do a sermon just on those. But one of them struck me in particular um, that I wanted to share with you. And then at, some, at one point in the video, you saw a plaque that you couldn't read because it was too blurry. So I'm gonna read the words that are on that plaque as you look at this um, final of photos, couple of photos as a closing. For the hanged and beaten, for the shot drowned and burned, for the tortured, tormented and terrorized, for those abandoned by the rule of law, we will remember with hope because hopelessness is the enemy of justice with courage because peace requires bravery with persistence because justice is a constant struggle and with faith because we shall overcome. The National Memorial for Peace and Justice is a work of art which is clearly able to speak the unspeakable. It is sacred and holy ground. It is healing to the victims and their families. And it is such a blessing to finally tell this untold story. Amen. Let us hold a moment of silence for what we've just seen and thought about. 